Thanks for coming out tonight. I'm Tom Lanny. I'm the director of the McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture. One of the core programs at the McFarland Center is proud to sponsor is the Kraft Hyatt Initiative for Jewish Christian Understanding, uh, which we, uh, we sponsor with Professor Alan Avery Peck, the Kraft Hyatt Professor of Judaic Studies. Um, uh, through that fund, we're able to enrich teaching and learning on the Holocaust, Jewish history, and contemporary life, and Jewish Christian relations. And today, we'll have a particular focus on uh, contemporary life. Uh, the program has enabled our faculty to attend scholars at Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Remembrance Center in Jerusalem. It supported faculty development in their development of classes, including a Maymester course in Central Europe on history, memory, and the Holocaust that a number of students have participated in and that some of us were talking about tonight at dinner. Uh, we sent students to study abroad at Hebrew University. If you've seen that chance come up with study abroad, that's something you might think of. There are scholarship opportunities for that. And we brought distinguished scholars for classroom visits, residencies, and public lectures like the one tonight. You can learn more about the past lectures and about what we do by visiting holycross.edu slash McFarland Center. Tonight I'm really pleased to welcome a foremost scholar in global contemporary anti-Semitism, Dr. Charles Asher Small. Dr. Small is the founding director and president of the Institute for the Study of Global Anti-Semitism and Policy, or ISGAP. He's also a Goldman Fellow at the Harold Hartog School of Government and Policy and a senior research fellow at the Moshe Dayan Center for Middle East and African Studies, which both of those are at Tel Aviv University. Dr. Small is committed to created scholarly pro creating scholarly programming and research on contemporary anti-Semitism at top universities internationally in establishing contemporary anti-Semitism studies as a recognized academic discipline. He's convened groundbreaking academic seminar series at Columbia, Fordham, Harvard, McGill, National University of Kiev in Ukraine, Sapienza University in Rome, the Sorbonne and the CNRS in Paris, Stanford and the University of Miami and Yale. Uh, some of those are published here in the Yale papers and other uh, volumes that he edited. He's organized an academic training program for professors at Oxford University. As he's meant author of six books, including six volumes, some of these, Global Antisemitism, A Crisis of Modernity, published by Brill and Isgap, The Yale Papers, Antisemitism in Comparative Perspective, and Antisemitism in Comparative Perspective, Volume 2. He's lectured internationally and worked as a consultant and policy advisor in North America, Europe, Southern Africa, and the Middle East. And as I recall, even one time we were talking to you with the, the Pope in Rome, or had just come back from seeing Pope Francis. So please join me in welcoming Charles Asher Small. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Landy. It's an honor to be here, <coughs> Professor Peck. Thank you uh, for the honor of being, being here. It's good to see you. It's a large, large crowd, so thank you. So tonight I'm going to speak about issues of contemporary anti-Semitism and also focusing on issues pertaining to the academy and contemporary anti-Semitism. And I think if you could remember one thing that I say this evening, I would argue that maybe this is the most important thing. And the, I'm going to quote the words of Professor Elie Wiesel. I'm sure many of you know who he was. So Professor Wiesel always argued that anti-Semitism begins with Jews, but it never ends with Jews. Anti-Semitism begins with Jews, but it never ever ends with Jews. So anti-Semitism is not a parochial Jewish problem, or a parochial Israeli problem, or a Zionist problem. It's a problem of humanity. It's a problem for people who believe in equality under the law. It's, people, it's a problem for people who believe in human rights and the notion of citizenship. And that this form of hatred, Professor Robert Wistrich called it the longest hatred, once this hatred is unleashed upon society, it knows no boundaries. It knows no bounds. And we were discussing parts or aspects of the Holocaust tonight over dinner. You can see that anti-Semitism began with Jews, but it didn't end with Jews. The death and destruction, not just for the Jewish community, the organized extermination and murder of more than six million Jews, systematically. We, we know, you, some of you are studying the Holocaust, it's very important, but the, the death and destruction of Europe, 
of civilians, of infrastructure, of entire villages and cities destroyed because of this sort of reactionary social movement that was allowed to foster and fester because it was only going to be a Jewish problem. And we see the death and destruction that, that came out of the rise of this reactionary social movement in Europe, and we can see it today. We can see the dehumanization and the demonization of Jews, and I'll get into the different phases of anti-Semitism in a moment, that we allow and we enable and we even encourage contemporary forms of anti-Semitism with an S, because it's only the problem for the Jews over there, or the Israelis over there, or the Zionists over there. But once this form of hatred is unleashed upon society, it doesn't know any boundaries. And we can see today, throughout the Middle East, in Syria, the carnage, the, the, I, would, I, I use the word genocide, the massacring of hundreds of thousands of people and the creation of millions, 15 million refugees from Syria, Iraq, as these reactionary forces have been unleashed upon society. And we can see these problems are not going to be contained. The refugee crisis spilling into Turkey, from Turkey into Europe, and we can see the reaction to this refugee crisis, to this, re this sort of reaction to the reactionary social movement. So Elie Wiesel's words today, tragically, tragically, still ring true. That anti-Semitism begins with Jews, but it doesn't end with Jews. And I'll get into and sort of unpack some of the issues and, and reasons why. And we, I also want to sort of use the words or quote the words of Emmanuel Levinas. Do people know Emmanuel Levinas' work? So Emmanuel Levinas, who was originally from Lithuania, he was a PhD student in France. And while his family was murdered and exterminated during the Holocaust, he managed to survive because he was in France. And Emmanuel Levinas, I would argue, many would argue, that he went on to become one of the most important philosophers of the 20th century. And what Emmanuel Levinas did, or one of the amazing things he did, he also... After the Holocaust, he reestablished Jewish education in Paris and in France. But one of the things that he did was to bring Jewish thought to the academy. So he wasn't just a Jewish scholar doing sociology or social sciences or philosophy, but he brought Talmudic thought, Jewish thought, Jewish ethics into the university basically for the first time. And he, he taught many important things, including the ethics of how we perceive and treat the other. And Emmanuel Levinas drawing on Talmudic texts and, and, and commentary argued and st stated that the moment we see our face in the face of the other, the moment we see our face in the face of the other, that's the instant we become human. Imagine. The moment we see our face in the face of the other is the instant we become human. And we learn that we need, if we're all created in the image of God, we need to see the godliness in each other. And if we happen to be anti-Semitic or sexist or racist, or we dismiss groups of people based on some preconceived or made-up notion, that we cheat ourselves we harm ourselves because we cut ourselves off to the truth of the other. So we need the other to learn and to grow and to become who we are supposed to be in this lifetime. So we need to see the other to become human. And this is sort of the ethics that guide us on an individual level and also on a, on a societal level. And what's interesting, I, do, I study with a rabbi, Akiva Zweig in Miami, few times a week, who's a, a brilliant teacher. And he was saying, and this is extraordinary also from the Torah and from the Talmud, that if we're created in the image of God, we all have to connect ourselves to God, to the higher being. 
whatever you want to label it. And if we affect each other in a negative way, if somebody harms me because of, I don't know, my ethnicity, my race, my religion, whatever it is, and it disturbs the connection I have, the godliness in me to God, if I'm disturbed, if I forget my connection or my connection is uh, distorted, whatever you want to call it, disturbed, that if we disturb the connection of somebody to the higher power, we are actually, in a sense, and, and this could be you know, on a small scale of being rude to somebody, uh, I'm, I'm just after Yom Kippur, so maybe I'm a little bit uh, you know, aware of these things. But even being rude or harming somebody's equilibrium, when you disconnect them from God, the profound responsibility we have for, for, for that action or inaction is, is, based on Talmudic and Torah teachings, profound. If we, if we disturb somebody's equilibrium and connection to their connection to God, we're responsible for a very serious deed. And I think we have to become very mindful of that. And I think Emmanuel Levinas and his work resonates on this issue. So I'm going to speak briefly about three stages of anti-Semitism or anti-Semitisms. And I'm going to cover anti-Semitism in a few moments, so sorry for the broad strokes and I know some of you are studying this, which is wonderful and very important. But I would break the, the, the forms of anti-Semitism into a religious Christian phase, into a racist phase, and into a, the contemporary context, the attack on who Jews are as a people. And what makes anti-Semitism so dangerous is its inherent genocidal tendency. So I would argue, unlike other forms of discrimination and racisms and sexism, and, and no matter how horrific and damaging these phenomenons have been throughout history and in the contemporary context, that there's something inherent about anti-Semitism that makes it genocidal, or inherently genocidal, and I'll explain why. So in the Christian phase of anti-Semitism, when Jews were perceived largely, not entirely, uh, through different periods of Christian history, namely in, in Europe and in other places, Jews were perceived as being blinded by not accepting the Christian notion of the Messiah. And that there was this belief that not only were Jews blinded by evil for not accepting the Christian notion of the Messiah, but that they were hindering the redemption of the world. So by Jews not accepting the Christian notion of the Messiah, they were cutting themselves off from personal redemption, and that the Jews' collectivity were hindering the advent of world redemption. So you can see the genocidal t element of this. If there's a group of people hindering global world redemption, you have to do something with these people. So you can convert them forcefully, drive them out, or in some cases, murder them. When it came to the racist notion of anti-Semitisms, um, when the, when, and you have to remember that these forms of anti-Semitism, I think, are connected to the dominant way of how people, thinkers, societies viewed the re, sort of global, the, the, the global reality. So when the religious phase was the dominant form of perceiving reality, this Christian phase of anti-Semitism had a tremendous impact. When things shifted from religion to science or pseudoscience and notions of race and ethnicity in the 19th century, the 20th century, Jews were perceived as, and this is the genocidal element again, Jews were perceived as being foreign elements within the nation and within the race. So that the race and the nation, or the purity of the race and the purity of the nation, had to be, um, they had to be saved from this sort of impurity and the threat of impurity from the Jewish race and ethnicity. So Jews who lived in communities and places and nations and, and spaces for many, many generations, for many, many centuries, 
were suddenly perceived as outsiders based on notions of race and ethnicity. And you can argue, unlike during the Christian phase where you had an out, you could convert if you were forced, the, the sort of the racist notion, the racist ideology was there's no escape from your innate racial characteristics and qualities. Some would even argue no matter how educated you were or how assimilated you were, you still couldn't uh, surmount your innate characteristics that were based on race, ethnicity, and science. So the Jews, in a sense, in, for people to save the, the white Aryan nation and race, the Jews had to be either removed or eliminated. And I think this form of anti-Semitism, I would argue, culminates in the Holocaust. So this is very crude, a very brief description of, of the history of anti-Semitism. But I think that we have to see the different general phases of anti-Semitism. And I think today we're faced with a new form of anti-Semitism. And what makes anti-Semitism so powerful is its way that it mutates and changes depending on the time and even the societies in which it exists. And I would say today there is the old religious form of anti-Semitism that's still around. In some places maybe even making a bit of a comeback. There's the old racist forms of anti-Semitism that exists, but I think certainly after the Second World War and the defeat of fascism and the civil rights movement in this country, racist anti-Semitism and old forms of Christian anti-Semitism are generally not tolerated. I think if somebody in a college like Holy Cross or at an Ivy League university or at Oxbridge or the Sorbonne at a good university would start speaking about Jews in the old Christian anti-Semitic way or in the old racist anti-Semitic way, I think they would be in serious social and even professional trouble. I don't think it would be tolerated in those circles, in the media of record. If somebody would write that in the New York Times or The Guardian or Le Monde, it would not be tolerated by and large. But today's anti-Semitism, contemporary anti-Semitism, attack Jews who they are as a people, attack Jews for their connection to Israel, to the land of Israel. This is not only tolerated, but I would argue, like the old dominant forms of anti-Semitism, it's part of a dominant discourse and a dominant cultural moment in which we are today in the United States, in Europe, and sort of in the West. So on the one hand, you have this sort of postmodern moment where Jews who still maintain a strong, coherent identity in the sort of postmodern hybrid moment where binary oppositions or binary identities are problematic and we're all hybrids, here are the Jews who suddenly have a strong religious or coherent religious, cultural, national identity with a strong connection to the land. At the end of the Second World War, in this sort of postmodern moment when thinkers and philosophers and postmodernity emerges, where we looked at the excesses of nationalism and, and sort of binary notions of identity, of nationalism, and we moved away from this into postmodernity, here are the Jews with this sort of fixed identity. So Israel, Zionism, the Zionist mo movement, if you will, becomes the trash can of every epithet that you can think of. So the Zionist entity is racist, it's uh, pinkwashing, it's colonial, it's imperial, it's apartheid. That's the Zionist entity. So you have this coming from progressive intellectual circles in the West. And what do we have for the last 20 or 30 years? The rise of political Islam in the East. When I speak about political Islam, I am not speaking about Islam, and I'm not speaking specifically about Muslims. Excuse me. Political Islam, or some people call it Islamism, is a political movement, it's a reactionary social movement that emerges in Egypt about 100 years ago. And political Islam, in a sense, was a reaction to British colonialism, namely in Egypt, and the, the Muslim Brotherhood, 
which is the sort of the foundation of political Islam, emerges about 100 years ago in Egypt and begins to have impact and influence in Egypt. And then, I'd say ideologically and politically, it sort of branches out through the Muslim world, as we say, into different parts of the Middle East and Africa and Asia with different strands of it. And it goes into the Sunni world, into Wahhabism, and even goes to influence the Iranian Revolution and its ideological uh, founding fathers in the Shiite world. So political Islam emerges about 100 years ago, and it fuses anti-Semitism, European anti-Semitism, with Islam. Has anybody here read the Hamas Charter? So please read it tonight. It's fascinating. It will take you 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and it's available, bless you, it's available in, in English, and I urge you to read it. If a professor, if, if a student wrote the Hamas Covenant and submitted it to a professor, that student would be expelled from any decent college for plagiarism. So basically, the Muslim Brotherhood, Hamas, and other um, elements of political Islam takes European anti-Semitism. We have to remember in the Islamic world, in the Muslim world, there wasn't really anti-Semitism. There was discrimination against Jewish people. There were even pogroms against Jewish people. Jews weren't allowed to uh, uh, have certain occupations. There was sort of economic and even spatial segregation in, in, the, in the Sunni world, but especially in the Shiite world. Um, in the 17th century, we have all kinds of fatwas that were ruled that Jews were impure. Notions that, and this notion of Jewish impurity existed in the Islamic world in different times and places. In the 17th century, in what is now Iran, there were notions that uh, fatwa rulings that Jews were impure, so they couldn't touch a Muslim. To this day, in Iran, a Jew cannot touch in public anyways a Muslim. A Jew cannot go out in the rain because when the rain falls on you outside and if you're impure, your impurities go into the environment. There are fatwa rulings from the 17th century that if a Jew was stuck in the rain and their garment becomes wet and the water begins to drip from the garment onto the cement or onto the ground, what do you do with the ground? Is the ground also impure? So there's all sorts of religious rulings. So what the, the ruling was, you have to dig up the earth and dispose of it because the ground is impure. Okay, uh, I have a friend who had to run away from Iran because he had the audacity to put money into a grocer's hand and touch his hand intentionally because he didn't want to touch a Jewish person's hand and he had to be snuck out of the country. So these, these practices still exist. So there's a fusion of old forms of anti-Jewish discrimination fused with this European genocidal form of hatred, which comes to the Middle East in the 1800s through colonialism, through missionaries, through Christian missionaries, bringing ideas of anti-Semitism to the Islamic world. So you have the rise of political Islam, and then you have sort of the postmodern, uh, I'd say, attack or intolerance of notions of Jewish peoplehood kind of coming together at the same moment. So you have sort of the liberal, I don't think they're really liberal, but we perceive them to be liberal, we call them liberal in our current discourse. You have kind of liberal anti-Jewish peoplehood, I'd call it anti-Semitism or Israel bashers, which is prevalent among intellectuals and the media of record in the West. And you have the rise of political Islam in the Middle East. Political Islam cannot accept the notion that a Jew is equal to a Muslim. That they are out to create a caliphate, a space in which Islamic law, as they understand it, as they understand it, will be imposed on this space. And in this space, a Muslim cannot be equal to a Jew or to a Christian or other non-Muslims. Women cannot be equal. Gay people can't be equal, right? So there's this notion. But Jews, if you think about it, are the only people in the Middle East, in the region, 
what is on, they would say, Islamic land that has self-determination. Israel is the only space in the Middle East where non-Muslims control the space. And from an Islamist perspective, from political Islamist perspective, since a Jew cannot be equal, it's not a question of boundaries. Should Israel withdraw from the 1967 boundaries, or the 1947 boundaries, or the 1948 boundaries? That's not the issue for political Islam, for the Muslim Brotherhood, for Hamas, for ISIS, for the Iranian Revolutionary Regime. The mere fact that a Jew is equal to a Muslim in the law is a problem. If Israel was to give all of its territory, except for Tel Aviv, they would give all the territory, but they would keep Tel Aviv as a city-state where Jews and others would be equal under a law in a democratic society. According to political Islam, that would not be tolerable either. <coughs> so it's not a question of boundaries. It's a question of citizenship. It's a question of democratic values or democratic notions versus Islamic notions, according to the Muslim Brotherhood, that has a very narrow definition of Islam. So, so in a sense, Israel and the Jewish people are kind of stuck in, this, in the middle of this uh, historic moment where postmodernity and radical Islam are rising. So I did a study with um, Ed Kaplan at Yale University, and we interviewed 5,000 people in 10 European countries. And we asked them a series of questions of classical anti-Semitism, that Jews stick together, or they assimilate and they take over, or Jews cheat in business, the old classical forms of anti-Semitism. And then we asked them a series of questions about what we, we called it Israel bashing. So we said Israel is an apartheid state, agree or disagree. The Israeli army intentionally shoots Palestinian children. The Israeli government poisons the water of Palestinian families. Very extreme cases, and based on our, our criteria, if people answered a certain amount of questions in each category, we, define, we categorized them as anti-Semitic, in the classical sense, and Israel bashers. And what we found in the 10 European countries is that anti-Semitism and Israel bashing was relatively low, or lower than we thought, which was good. But what we found was staggering. We found that people who are Israel bashers are 13 times more likely than the national average to be anti-Semitic in the classical sense. So the correlation is very strong. So if you can imagine if Holy Cross water was 13 times more likely to cause cancer than other forms of water, there'd be, this would be removed from the shelf and there'd be an inquiry how this water was sold. Right? But that is what happened in Europe, that people who are Israel bashers are much more likely to be anti-Semitic. Not all. Not all people who are critical of Israel are necessarily anti-Semitic, but the correlation is powerful. Um, so I think that this is a very important point. And there's a study by Barry Cosman that shows, which is quite staggering, that anti-Semitism on American university campuses and also campuses in the United Kingdom is extraordinarily high. Where women, American and British women, uh, on students on campus experience sexism I think it's about 23 or 24 percent of women who are in or college students or university students experienced or have witnessed a sexist act, experienced sexism or seen a sexist act within a one-year period. African American students, it's about 27 or 28 percent. African American students either experiencing or witnessing a racist act. For Jewish students in the United States and in the United Kingdom, it's over 80 percent. 80 percent have seen or witnessed, witnessed or experienced an anti-Semitic act. So anti-Semitism is spiking, particularly on campuses, particularly in universities. And we can see this sort of happening in different uh, situations. I'm, I'm, I wrote in my notes to discuss uh, Jeremy Corbyn in the United Kingdom and, and Donald Trump here. And I think what's 
happening. I think what's happening in the situation with Corbyn. I think Corbyn, to me, represents what we call the Red-Green Alliance. The extreme left in the West and the extreme Islamists in the Middle East and also in, in the West as well. So in the sort of postmodern moment, the agenda among intellectuals, I would argue, largely, I'm, I'm being quite general, has been sort of anti-Western hegemony, anti-racist, anti-imperialist, right? And then you have, in a sense, the extreme green, which, which is the extreme Islamic radicals, who are also anti-Western hegemony and anti-colonial and anti-neo-imperialists. So you have this sort of strange alliance between the extreme left and the extreme green. And I think Corbyn really represents that. And you can see it. So Corbyn, the head of the Labour Party, is deeply anti-Israel, anti-Zionist, um, very anti-fascist in a way, anti-Holocaust, anti-fascism from World War II, but very anti-Zionist and very anti-nationalist. And you have his, his, um, his sort of alliance with Iran and the Muslim Brotherhood. And you can look at people like George Galloway, Ken Livingston, kind of people on the extreme left of the Labour Party in the United Kingdom, working with the Iranian Revolutionary Regime and the Muslim Brotherhood, which is, you would think, kind of two movements that should be diametrically opposed to each other. And in a sense, you have the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood, who I'll, sh I'll show you a clip, actually, that use uh, old European anti-Semitism. So I started to say, the Hamas Charter takes the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Do people know what the Protocols of the Elders of Zion are? Okay. So this is the, a document, a forged fake document, that purports to be the minutes of a meeting, a secret meeting, where Jews were d discussing and planning to take over the world and to take over the banks, etc., etc. So the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. That document played a significant role in the Holocaust. That anti-Semitism, the, the anti-Semitism of, of Jewish conspiracies, lay the foundation for the Holocaust. And what Elie Wiesel always used to say is that the Holocaust didn't happen, or didn't begin, rather, with the railroad tracks and the crematoriums, or the bricks and the crematoriums. It began with words and with ideas. And the words and the ideas and the protocols of the elders of Zion lay the foundation to dehumanize Jewish people to legitimize the fact that they were put into ghettos, removed from society, removed from their jobs. And I, should, and I should say, the only institution in Germany that voluntarily gave up their Jewish colleagues, it wasn't the army, it wasn't the police, it was the universities. The universities were the only institution in society that offered up its Jews without being forced to. Imagine, Heidegger, we think of Heidegger, and Hannah Arendt, right? These are the darlings of our, of our thinking. Imagine, imagine, sort of sanitized, I don't know what, Nazism, right? This is legitimate thinkers. These are the people who gave up their colleagues voluntarily so that they can have their jobs. So the Protocols of the Elders of Zion legitimizes the removal of Jews from society, from their jobs, puts them into ghettos, and then from the ghettos we know the final solution. The Protocols of the Elders of Zion was taken <clears throat> by the Muslim Brotherhood, who also had and enjoyed very good relations with the fascist movement in Europe, with the Nazis in Europe. Right? And this is the beginning, the, the foundation of modern Palestinian nationalism, the Muslim Brotherhood's role in the PLO, in Yasser Arafat, in Mahmoud, Mahmoud Abbas, not just Hamas, but in the thinking of the anti-Israel uh, movement in the Middle East, coming from this sort of religious European anti-Semitic slash fascist background. So here you have Yosef Kawadawi. Do you know who Yosef Kawadawi is? 
Yosef Kaudawi is the, the most, certainly was until recently, the most important religious thinker perhaps in the Muslim world, uh, worldwide. He was the head of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, in exile in Qatar, very, very influential, enjoyed great relations with Western countries, including this country, over time. Oxford University, where I'm going to be going to in a couple of weeks for a year. Islamic Studies, the first, the founder of Islamic Studies at Oxford University is this gentleman. And I would like to play the tape just to give you a taste of where his worldview comes from. Okay, so th this is a small taste, sort of uh, supporting the notion of Hitler and, his, and what he did to the Jews. And this is not Yosef Kaudawi who woke up in a bad mood or had a bad day. This is a central element of the Muslim Brotherhood's ide ideology of European notions of genocidal anti-Semitism fused with a specific understanding of Islam. They believe, the Muslim Brotherhood believes, that Jews emanate from apes and pigs, that Jews also emanate from the urine of donkeys, that Jews, according to the protocols of the elders of Zion, according to the covenant of this reactionary social movement, are the causes of all the problems in the world, capitalism, communism, etc., etc. So please read the Hamas covenant, and please read the founding fathers of the Muslim Brotherhood. So read Kawadawi, read Qutub and Benai, people who, who were, had refuge in this country, who formed a lot of their, their ideas in the United States. The Iranian revolutionary regime. And imagine, I, I was very active as a young person in the anti-apartheid movement. I worked with the leadership of the African National Congress. I was there in the 1980s and 90s on the ground, um, living in places like Kayalicha. Kayalicha was a, is a, was a illegal sort of shanty town with no infrastructure. I was there on the ground in the late 80s, working with the leadership of the African National Congress. I come from a human rights perspective or background. I worked with indigenous people, the First Nations, we call them in Canada, or what is now Canada. Some of my research that I did was on the biotic people, which I'm sure nobody really knows about the biotic people here. The biotic people were the indigenous people of what we now call, fittingly, new found land. New found land. The British colonized new found land, and for 132 years, they hunted the biotic people for sport, for sport. And in 1836, the last biotic person, her name was So Anduit, she died, resulting in the complete annihilation of the indigenous people of Newfoundland. So documenting this, right, knowing the history uh, coming from a background of human rights. Imagine 
to my chagrin that here Iran, Iranian revolutionary regime that comes from a very specific ideolo ideology of genocidal anti-Semitism, they cannot accept the existence of Israel because the very existence of Israel is not legitimate in their view. A Jew cannot be equal to a Muslim. There cannot be a democracy on Islamic land. Israel must be destroyed. Okay? It's not Israeli policy. It's not Israeli boundaries or borders. It's the mere fact that a Jew is equal to a Muslim on Islamic land that has to be eradicated <clears throat> according to their ideology. So if we study their ideology, if we learn about the other, if we learn about this reactionary social movement, and how when they speak about destroying Israel, using Nazi imagery and Nazi discourse and Nazi ideology, speaking about the extermination of Jews, playing a role with the Muslim Brotherhood in the Sunni world, not only building a nuclear weapon to destroy Israel, but exporting anti-Semitism through the internet, in universities, in the media, that here's a regime dedicated to the annihilation of the Jewish people, which the West, the P5 plus one, ended up entering into an agreement which was lauded by people who were progressive in the West. Billions of dollars transferred to killing f operations in Iraq and Syria. As we speak, the resources are being used to kill people. And yet, it was the stubborn Jews, it was the stubborn Zionists, it was the stubborn Netanyahu that stood in the way of peace and progress. So imagine a regime that calls openly for a destruction of not just Israel, but of the Jewish people, being rewarded, accommodated, given resources, cash, airplanes of cash, right? Big deals with Boeing and Siemens and other European companies. And coming from an anti-apartheid background, I couldn't imagine, imagine, in 19 the late 1980s, the early 1990s, when the anti-apartheid movement was at its strongest. It was sort of this international cultural revulsion of organized racist ideologies and government, a regime that was running every aspect of a society based on racism. The world was fed up. But could you imagine if a president of the United States made a deal with the apartheid regime and transferred resources, money, cash, and big corporate deals with that regime, I think there would have been pandemonium in the streets. I think universities like Holy Cross, the students would have been protesting, would have been upset. And yet, here was the West rewarding this regime. And now we see the results, the tragic results of the, the area, the Middle East, the Sunni, Shiite, conflict where anti-Semitic, European anti-Semitic, fascistic social movements focusing on the Jews. This is what the Nazis did, exactly what the Nazis did, focus on the Jew, focus on the corrupt business dealings of the Jew, focus on the shtetl, focus on the Zionists, focus on Netanyahu, focus on Likud, focus on the settlements. And over here, we have societies being taken over by anti-democratic, racist, fascist, sexist elements. And now we have inherited this mess. And the mess is also, I would argue, the silence, the silence of progressive human rights activists, the silence of our political leaders and our policymakers and our intellectuals and the journalists and the media of record to this contemporary form of anti-Semitism. And now that refugees are fleeing, the silence, uh, I'll never forget the, the shooting, and in, in, I'll, I'll wrap it up and take questions shortly, um, but the attack on the kosher market in Paris when 
the, the previous president said that this was an attack on some deli, when Mr. Koulibaly, the murderer of the four Jewish people in the supermarket in Paris on the eve of Shabbat, went up to every Jewish person that he shot at point blank range and asked them if they were Jewish in the Jewish shop on the eve of Shabbat, and when, they, when he found out they were Jewish, executed him. Mr. Koulibaly was part of Daesh, ISIS. What he did was a good deed. He became a martyr for his struggle. And this was this type of reactionary anti-Semitism, reactionary social movements was ignored by our leaders. And now, when people are being threatened and our intellectuals have remained silent and our political leaders have remained silent, now we have the reaction to it. Now we have Charlottesville. So in this global world, if we can accept the Iranian revolutionary regime's genocidal anti-Semitism, if we can accept the Muslim Brotherhood's anti-Semitism because it's in Egypt, or it's in Gaza, or it's in the suburbs of Paris, in this globalized world, why are we shocked that white nationalists who don't have to cover their face in a hood anymore, they can walk open-faced because there's no social cost apparently to their openness anymore, that they can walk saying Nazi things in Charlottesville when the core ideology, the foundation of political Islam and white nationalism and racism and fascism are the same. So we see in this country, you can call it dog whistles, you can call it a dividing of society, you can see the dog whistles that are being sent to Europe. We can see the rise of nationalism in Europe. Looking at the streets of Germany in the last few weeks, where there's been basically riots against people who look foreign or people who are perceived to be refugees or immigrants. So you have this reaction to it. And I would say that in a sense, it's because of our silence that we allowed this reactionary social movement to grow. We gave them places in our institutions. We allowed them to open up centers. We allowed them to, to represent the Muslim world. And now we have a situation, a global situation, where the rise of political Islam is serious. And now the rise of this sort of backlash in the West to the crisis is becoming serious. So I think this gets back to the original point, and then I'll open it for questions, is that, in a sense, anti-Semitism really begins with Jews, but it doesn't end with Jews. And today, ladies and gentlemen, we are now facing serious, I'd say, challenges to our basic notions of democracy, our basic notions of citizenship, that you can be on the left or you can be on the right, you could be religious or secular, but I bet everybody in this room would agree that everybody should be equal under one law, regardless of our backgrounds. Basic notions of citizenship. And I often tell my students that I'm, I'm Jewish because my mother's Jewish. That's the only reason why I'm Jewish. That's how I was born. I had no choice. That's from my worldview. But every generation has to struggle to live in a democratic society. And this is something we don't inherit. People before us struggled to lay down the foundations of democratic societies. They struggled to expand it. And it's our roles, particularly the students, to take the baton and to continue to safeguard democratic principles and to push even further to ensure that everybody is guaranteed to be equal, equal citizens under one law. And that when reactionary social movements emerge in one part of the world, we have to be mindful. Even though they may not be talking about our group, they only may be talking about certain groups that we have to come together and understand them, study them, understand the mind of the enemy of democratic principles and struggle together to fight them. So 
I'll end there, and I'll be happy to take questions or comments. Thank you. So I'll say, I don't like the term Islamophobia. I have a problem with it. Um, it's a notion that was actually created by the Iranian Revolutionary Regime. And I would say it's a, it was a, it's a notion that tries to limit criticism of regimes like Iran, like the Iranian regime. And I, I, I would, I, I kind of, I'm more comfortable looking at issues of discrimination against Muslims or anti-Muslim anti sentiment or anti-Islamic sentiment. I don't like the idea of Islamophobia. Maybe I'm, I'm splitting hairs. Uh, but I think, I think it's important to know the origin of the notions that were, the words and the notions that we're using. And I think Islamophobia should be unpacked as a concept and we should understand the origins and intent of it. But we have to be extraordinarily mindful of anti-Islamic and anti-Muslim feeling. And the amazing thing is the Reactionary social movements, political Islam, which was sort of a, it's a taboo to even speak about. If you speak about it, you must be a supporter of Donald Trump or something, right? Um, but the tragedy of this sort of reactionary social movement, the, the greatest victim by far of this barbaric movement are Muslims, by far. So those, of, those who try to silence discussion and debate and even argument on, on what's happening in the Islamic world because if you speak critically of the Muslim Brotherhood or the Iranian Revolutionary Regime, you're Islamophobic, it is, is tragic, especially in democratic societies. So I think we have to um, look at the results of these reactionary social movements, look at the agenda and look at the damage that it's causing in, in in small communities in, in this country to, to horrible situations in places like Syria and Iraq, in Nigeria, and, and other spaces. I think we have to be extraordinarily, we have to learn. We have to know the context. We have to understand the context. And I think we have to distinguish between a reactionary social movement, its ideology, its intention, its, in, its agenda, and notions of Islam and Muslim communities in the world. And that distinction is very important. So here you have an anti-Semitic, anti-democratic, sexist, anti-minority, anti-toleration movement that's growing. And somehow, in the name of progressive thought in the West, we have to be quiet. I, I think that's that's... that's extraordinarily dangerous. And this is where political correctness comes in. So we have this sort of, I don't know, guilty conscience or collective guilt from the colonial times. And as we should, colonialism did horrific things to many parts of the world, many parts of the world, including this part of the world. Um, but I don't think it, it, we, have, we, we should... Uh, throw away our our values and not support people who are struggling against repressive regimes and repressive movements um, because we did bad things there in the past. We should be mindful. We should tread carefully. But when we see uh, regimes bombing their own people with chemical weapons, when we see massacres happening time and time and time again for six, seven years at a time, uh, we, we can't speak out against it. We can't act against it because of what? And, and you're progressive by sitting and watching it happen? That's insanity as far as, far as I'm concerned. So, and how do you stop anti-Semitism? In, in the Islamic world, there are, there are heroes. There are people who risk their lives fighting against this reactionary totalitarian violent movement who risked their lives uh, fighting it and fighting anti-Semitism and fighting for equality. And I think those are the, the people, the intellectuals, the journalists, the, uh, the average citizen who stand up against this repressive culture 
uh, that we should be, I think, helping, not helping those who are involved in the suppression of their own people, like we've been doing in, in, in Western countries for a long time because of short-term gain, be it geopolitical gain, military gain, and economic gain. So do business with Iran because it's good for the short term. But what's going to, you know, how far do you kick the can down the road? How many hundreds of thousands of millions of people are going to be killed? 50, how many refugees can we tolerate and can we absorb? And when is it going to stop? So, so, yeah. So I think this sort of, there's like this false dichotomy that if you're, critical of political Islam, then you're harming Muslims. I'd say the opposite is true. If you're fighting for this, the rights of Jewish people to have self-determination um, in, in their homeland or part of their homeland, then somehow it's being reactionary. I, I, don't, I don't get it. So I would say focus on the notion of political Islam. So I said several times in the lecture, and I mean it, I didn't really, I didn't comment on Islam. I didn't make any analysis of the religion of, the, of Islam. And I specifically said I'm not speaking about Islam or Muslims. I'm speaking about political Islam, which is a reactionary social movement. So I would urge you to read the Hamas Charter, to read uh, the works of Qutub and Abanai and, and Kawadawi. And... Um, and Tarek Ramadan, the, 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 the hero, right? The intellectual hero of our time, who now is rotting in a prison in France for violence against women. Right? So to read, to read these intellectuals and to understand where they're coming from, what their political and ideological agenda is. And this is, to me, a reactionary, anti-Semitic, anti-democratic movement that needs to be understood by intellectuals and students, and I would say confronted and fought against. Like, like we now, 70, 80 years later, are proud to say that we're anti-racist and we're anti-fascist and we're anti-Nazi. It's good. But at the time, where, where were the intellectuals? So where, where are we now? Where are the students and where are the intellectuals speaking up against what's happening in Syria and Iraq? Why are uh, places like Oxford University and Georgetown and Harvard and many other places receiving money from the Iranian Revolutionary Regime and the Muslim Brotherhood? How is that possible? How is it possible that an anti-Semitic person who thinks that women are um, the property of men, how do they open up a research center in a space um, which is the foundation for democratic societies and principles? And, or at least have a debate, a discussion about it. But we can't really even discuss it because the short-term gain for institutions. Right? So democratic principles. So read political Islam. Understand that there's a big difference between Islam and political Islam. And as students, study the ideology. Understand the discourse. Where does it come from? Why did it evolve? Why is it gaining traction? Maybe neoliberal globalization is causing a vacuum that this movement is growing. So to, to study what's, what's taking place, what's the ideology, what's the agenda? How do they implement their agenda? Intellectually, politically, militarily. So to understand what's going on. The politics of identity is to some extent, or maybe to a large extent, determined by power. Right? So people have the power to define themselves. If, if people have the power to define themselves, they can be who they are, who they want to be. So I think the question is, who's defining, who's defining Israel and who's defining the Jews? So if the Muslim Brotherhood is defi defining Israel and the Jews, that's one thing. So I don't think we can uh, differentiate. Um, and what's interesting with the BDS movement, and we were doing research on this project at our institute, is looking at how the Muslim Brotherhood um, is funding the, the groups like Students for Justice in Palestine, and a lot of the BDS movements on campuses in the United States, in Canada, and in Europe, 
are being funded by Yosef Kawadawi and his, and his well-organized movement and well-financed movement, extraordinarily well-financed movement. And we can see that the politics on campus are being affected and also from places like Saudi Arabia and Qatar, we're talking about billions and billions of dollars coming into American universities that are not being reported properly to the IRS or to the Department of Education. So we have this impact on discourse, and I think ultimately the universities are almost the front line for contemporary anti-Semitism in the West. And the BDS movement should be understood, in my view, as anti-Semitic. So it's nobody in the Jewish community or in the Zionist side is saying any criticism, any criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic. That's ridiculous. And if anybody picks up an Israeli newspaper or knows anything about Israeli political discourse or culture or the universities or the media, it's a vibrant society with all kinds of debates and arguments. Amazingly so. So, you know, nobody's trying to curtail or silence criticism of Israel or Israeli policies. But what the BDS movement is doing is trying to eradicate Israel, to eliminate Israel. So if Israel is a racist, apartheid, colonial, pinkwashing, imperialist entity, from a liberal human rights perspective, we have to dismantle this entity. Right? If it's true, we have to dismantle it. And that's what's at stake. So what the BDS movement is trying to do is to demonize Israel to the point where Western, liberal, progressive thinking people should band together to eliminate it, to have a one-state solution with its uh, Palestinian Muslim neighbors. So that's what's at stake, and I would argue that that's anti-Semitic, particularly when you look at the agenda and the ideology of where this movement developed, who's supporting it, where it comes from. And when you look at people like Jeremy Corbyn, who my colleagues and I, people like Erwin Kotler and David Mattis and other scholars connected to to our work, we helped to create the definition on anti-Semitism, which Corbyn is clearly violating. And he tried to, when he finally had to accept, the Labour Party had to accept the international definition of uh, anti-Semitism, he tried to pass a resolution that the Labour Party would accept the definition if the, they had the, the people have the right, no, if people, I don't remember the exact wording, but something to the effect that the, the, um, that Zionism and the, the environment in which it was created was racist. It, it's, it's amazing. So, so these are very important issues. So I think the BDS movement, I would argue, is very much part of contemporary anti-Semitism. And, yeah, and I think... There is a schism in the American Jewish community and that I think is deep and deepening in, in, in the United States, particularly in the United States, more so than in other diaspora communities in the West, like Canada, the United Kingdom, France, and other European countries. It's the division in the Jewish community here is, uh, is deep. And I think it kind of goes to this notion of trying to separate who Jews are as a people from their ancestral homeland or ancestral identity. Now, can't we just be American Jews? Can't you just leave us alone? You know, the sort of the, the reform notion that you can build Jerusalem anywhere. Whereas in Judaism, there's one, Ju there's one Jerusalem. But in Reform Judaism, which is a powerful element of American Jewry, there's this notion that you can build Jerusalem anywhere. So it's interesting how these things are being played out. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.